Hi, everyone. This is E. David Crawford, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Grand Rounds in Urology. Joining me is Dr. Mark Garnick, who is a Gorman Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. I can't think of any anyone that has contributed more to advanced prostate cancer than Mark has in his career. Um, he uh, published a pivotal study back in the mid-80s, along with a, another friend of mine, Mike Lede. That got luprolide on the map, the the uh, study that was done, and then uh, followed up with that. Mark's done a lot of research, got involved with uh, the uh, GNRH antagonist, and uh, uh, recently has uh, focused on something that we all should know about, and that is some of the side effects of ADT. And I'd just like Mark to comment a little bit about ADT and where we are with this and what is the way forward. Mark, thanks for being with us. David, thank you very much. It's nice to be here and thanks for inviting me. You know, the 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 history the history of uh cardiovascular issues with systemic therapies for prostate cancer really goes back to the, you know, many decades ago. You know, the use of diethylstilbestrol, for example, and it, it improved cancer-specific survival, but that was offset by the increased and excessive amount of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, which really, was, you know, really put a damper into the, into the use of that agent. And, you know, as, as David mentioned, my, I, I, along with Mike Loday and Jay Smith at that time at the University of Utah, were the principal investigators on the Luprolide versus diethylstilbestrol study. And in essence, that was a small study, but it was gained FDA marketing authorization by virtue of the fact that it had similar efficacy, but there was less cardiovascular morbidity and mortality associated with luprolide given subcutaneously on a daily basis compared to a three milligram dose of, of diethylstilbestrol. But since that time, you know, there's been a lot of interest in sort of understanding the pathophysiology of cardiovascular issues associated with androgen deprivation therapy. And to be perfectly honest, because many patients, you know, decades ago, where it came in with far advanced forms of prostate cancer before uh, the popularity of PSA-based screening, and though the, many of these patients, and this is even predating statin use, many of these patients had pre-existing cardiovascular morbidity. Uh, it was not un it was not uncommon for a patient that had a cardiovascular death uh, from uh, prostate cancer while receiving systemic therapies was attributed either rightly or wrongly to pre-existing cardiovascular disease. And it's only recently that we've really become more interested in the sort of understanding uh, the mechanisms and pathophysiologies I mentioned of cardiovascular risk factors. And there's been a lot of controversy. Each of these agents have is definite uh, metabolic and uh, cardiometabolic consequences associated with changing levels of serum testosterone. And these include the development of hypertension, the development of hypokalemia, weight gain, lipid abnormalities, uh, abnormal insulin resistance characteristics, uh, pre predisposition to prediabetes or diabetes. So these have all become very, very important. And that you know each new agent that's introduced, whether it be an, an LHRH agonist or a GNRH antagonist, they're all uh, they're all associated with cardiovascular issues. And I think what David has been trying to do is to try to you know categorize what is the pre, the pre existing risk factor when patients are being considered for androgen deprivation therapy. And we know, for example, from work from a whole series of investigators that if a patient has no previous history of cardiovascular issues, what we call MACE or major adverse cardiovascular events measured in a, in a variety of ways and has no family history, the likelihood of that patient getting into cardiovascular complications from systemic therapy is actually pretty small. However, those with a pre-existing cardiovascular history or for example, a prior history of myocardial infarction, cardiac arrhythmias, hypertension, obesity, abnormal hemoglobin A1C levels, those patients are, are definitely in, at increased risk for developing cardiovascular complications. And we now, we now are beginning to understand some of the pathophysiology and a lot of the uh, really unresolved issues are whether or not there are differential 
cardiovascular safety features between agonists and antagonists, for example. And that's a that's a subject, you know, still uh, under intense investigation. Right. The pronounced study that looked, tried to answer that question uh, came up short in terms of the event numbers and the number of patients that were previously identified to be needed to answer that question. And that was an inconclusive analysis, uh, really prompted by the fact that uh, do antagonists have a less cardiovascular side effect profile than an, than LHRH agonist? That's an unresolved issue. Uh, there were, uh, Dr. Car Crawford and I have been involved in some meta-analyses using DRG large databases uh, to really question what do, what is the relative contribution to cardiovascular morbidity and mortality compared to the largest class of agents, LHRH agonist versus GNRH antagonist. So it's an area of active investigation. What is needed is uh, really a more comprehensive approach to identifying patients at potential risk of cardiovascular complications, amassing a team of individuals, whether it be primary care physicians, uh, cardio-oncologists, cardiologists, urologists, medical oncologists, to really address the entire safety issue of cardiovascular uh, issues that patients ongoing on ADT uh, can face. And so I think that's sort of, you know, my, my blueprint of, of, of what the issues are. And I, I think Dr. Crawford has been really instrumental in, in spearheading an effort to provide a national education program for helping educate a wide spectrum of physicians and nurses and uh, uh, physician assistants to really engage in, uh, in really developing the safest and most comprehensive uh, and efficacious use of uh, these very, very important agents, but have significant side effects that need to be understood uh, mechanistically and managed. Mark, thank you. I, I appreciate the, uh, the compliments and uh, comments. Um, as always, you covered things in a short period of time and, and laid a lot out on the plate here. Uh, I, you, you, you know, as well as I do, in oncology, we tend to try to want to stratify patients. Uh, we have performance status, which has been around for a long time, one, two, three, and four, and a lot of other ways. Uh, we know that there's a lot of interest in sort of the higher risk patients in cardio-oncology and so forth. And uh, as you know, we've had a lot of conversations in the last couple of years, and and come forward with uh, at, at least a blueprint, uh, somewhat like the performance score, uh, the therapeutic risk score (TRS) uh, for ADT, and and that it's it's you know we've been sort of using it in the background that a lot a lot of things in medicine we see that you know, there's a green light, there's a yellow light, and there's a red light, and clearly as you said, a, a lot of men that that are in, in reasonable shape and don't have prior cardiovascular events or hypertension, diabetes, things like that, are not the ones at risk. We ought to focus the one on the people that are, um, the people with the, the yellow light. But you know, there's also, as you well know, and, and we've talked about, a real red light where you really have to assess the dangers and the risk of putting somebody on ADT um that has some of these things and you can precipitate events so look forward uh to more from you and uh working with you at, uh, on, and others on this I, I i think this is an important message to get out and one of the other things i believe we've learned is you got to keep it simple we can't uh, have things too complicated for the clinician is that they need this sort of little buckets that, that's easy to remember which way to go forward but you and I, I think, would both agree ADT is the foundation that we use to treat a lot of advanced prostate cancer. Um, any other comments, Mark? Uh, no, I think uh, I think the educational effort and the recognition of the wide spectrum of metabolic effects, for example, even patients on some of the, new, the new, newer agents such as abiraterone or enzalutamide, they have their own independent cardiovascular issues. Abiraterone you know, is, uh, is associated with hypertension, hypokalemia, fluid retention, uh, the need for stress doses of steroids uh, that you know, if the patient's undergoing surgery or is in an accident or has some traumatic activity. So the entire, the entire systemic therapies 
for patients with prostate cancer, ADT and beyond, really demand a more comprehensive approach to fully understanding uh, the, the probably the, the, a leading cause of morbidity and mortality, even in patients with advanced forms of prostate cancer. I mean, statistics show that more people die of with advanced forms of prostate cancer die of cardiovascular issues than they do of prostate cancer. So it really yep. becomes incumbent upon on providers to understand this in a more comprehensive fashion. Well, we, we've got a, a, a great treatment that has uh, super responses, and now we're you know doublets and triplets, and you know uh, I, I think we're on the road to making some of uh, the patients with advanced prostate cancer turn it into a chronic disease and. When you have chronic diseases, you have to monitor what you're doing. Mark, thanks so much for taking time from your busy schedule to share this with us. Um, we've got a lot more to talk about, and we'll do that in uh, some future uh, times here for Grand Rounds in Urology. Thanks, Mark. David, thank you very much.